series titled Invested Feeding Our Future. And what I want for all of you is for you to become like a squirrel, which is cheesy, I know, Sherry, but it's true. I want you to be like a squirrel because squirrels, as I said in the children's sermon, they are really good at investing now in order to feed their future. Right now, there's little furry ones out there and they're picking up seeds and nuts and whatever else that squirrels eat. And they're eating some of it today, yes. But they're also squirreling away. They're putting away some of that food because winter is coming and they want to have a good winter. They want to have a good future. And here's what I know about each and every one of you. You want to have a good future. You want to have a good future for yourself, for your kids, for your grandkids. You want to have a good future for your community and for your church. And so you need to learn how to get invested because only by investing can you get a return. Imagine if Apple stock was a double in price tonight. Some people tomorrow would be really, really excited because they would be rich. But I wouldn't be excited because I'm not invested in Apple stock. And so it would make no difference in my life because only by investing can you get a return. And so we want to learn how to become invested. Last week, we started off talking about a central skill or ability that you must have in order to make a good investment. And that skill, that ability is faith. We don't think of faith that way too often, but I think it is a skill or ability, something you can grow, something you can get better at. Here's a definition of faith. Faith is the ability to do what you can do and trust God to do what only God can do. Do what you can do. And trust God to do what only God can do. I, I've talked about faith with this image quite a few times. Uh, if this is the first time you've seen this, let me explain. If you were to think about all the factors in your life, the things you can control and the things you can't control, things like you know where you were born, uh, wh whether you're a male, female, um, what your parents were like, what's going on in the global economy, natural disasters, what other people are doing and their motives. If you think about all the things that influence your life, what percentage do you control? I don't know. But for argument's sake, let's say it's 10%. And here's what I've observed about myself and about other people, is that what we tend to focus on is the 90%, the things we can't control. Well, they should, and he should, and they should have, and what about the weather, and this sort of thing. And we spend our energy on this 90% we can't control. And so when it comes to our 10%, we got barely anything left. And this should be kind of good news because um, sometimes in life we feel a bit overwhelmed, don't we? And we feel like we have to take care of it all. But faith is the understanding that you don't have to take care of it all because you can't take care of it all. God is in the picture. Your percentage is about 10%, way less than you thought it was. But here's the deal. You got to give it your best when it comes to your 10% because a mediocre effort is going to bring mediocre results. A half-hearted effort will bring half-hearted results. And so when it comes to your 10%, you got to give it your all. Or to put it another way, to live your best, you got to give your best. And we teach this to our kids. We already know. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But to live your best, you got to give your best. And so there's a certain way, like when you, when you give your best, it, it doesn't matter what the outcomes are because you gave your best. You, you, you won in a certain way. I remember Sophie about a year and a half ago. She's six years old. She played on a soccer team. So at the time, she was like four. And watching four-year-olds play soccer is basically like watching cats play soccer. You know, I mean, it's not really a game. And so I didn't care if she scored goals or if her team won. That didn't matter. All I cared about was that she got in the game, she did her best. Because I know, and you already know, that if you over and over again, just give your best in whatever circumstances you have, it is the best chance you have to live your best. So today, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about an ancient story of these two brothers, one of them who gives his best. And then we're going to talk about your most valuable resource that you have, which is not your money. It's not even your relationships. It's your time. Because you can make more money, but you can't make more time. When your time's up, your time's up. And so we're going to finish by talking about your time. So let's jump into this old story. It's in Genesis 4. And uh, what you need to know in terms of the context of the story was that there was these two people in the book of Genesis named Adam and Eve. Many of you have heard of them. According to the writer of Genesis, they were the first human beings. And they lived in this beautiful place called the Garden of Eden. And then they messed it up. And then they tried to blame everybody and didn't take any responsibility for messing it up. And most of us, that's kind of the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story for Adam and Eve. 
Because they have sex. At least we think they do. Because they have two kids. They have a son named Cain, who's a farmer, and they have a son named Abel, who ends up becoming a herdsman, or he's taking care of livestock. And so that's where we jump into the story. It says, Cain presented an offering to the Lord from the land's crops, while Abel, his brother, presented his flock's oldest offspring with their fat. Now notice the connection to time. It's old because it has the most time invested. The Lord looked favorably on Abel in his sacrifice, but didn't look favorably on Cain in his sacrifice. Now, it, he didn't criticize Cain's sacrifice. He just didn't look favorably on it. Abel brings his old, you know, uh, livestock, and God's like, oh my gosh, look how old and fat that is. That's wonderful. Thank you. And then Cain brings his, and he's like, well, you know, thanks. Right? So he just didn't look favorably. But Cain became angry, and he looked resentful. And some of you might know that this is not Cain, okay, because they lived in Mesopotamia and probably had dark features, plus this is a child. But I Googled resentful, and this is what came up. And it cracked me up because this is what Sophie looks like when she's mad at me. She crosses her arms, and she glares at me, and Sophie actually growls. She's like, Arr! and I'm like, are you growling? <laughs> like, right? But here's the point. Like, when you get angry, you look angry. And people can tell. And what God says next to Cain is just so brilliant. It's so remarkable. And it gets to the heart of the matter in terms of how we handle our anger. Because God says, why are you angry? Why do you look so resentful? In other words, take a look in the mirror. Reflect on yourself. Ask the question, why am I angry? Because if you ask the question, why am I angry? Then you can ask another question. Is it worth being angry about this? And then you can ask an even deeper question. Did I play a role in this? And, and what we tend to do is we tend to project, not reflect when we're angry. We say, you know, he did it and she did it and they're wrong and they made me angry as if they have the power over you. And God's saying, hey, look at yourself. Look in the mirror. Reflect. Don't project. And then he goes on to offer this amazing teaching. He says, if you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? To which we'd all say, yeah. And who would accept you? Well, first and foremost, you'd accept yourself. Have you ever, you know, back in the day when you were students, you, you took a test and you didn't do well, and you know why you didn't do well, because you really didn't study. And then you took another test and you didn't do well, but you studied really hard. You feel different in those two circumstances. Because in one, you gave it your best. And the other, you know why you failed. And God is saying to Cain, hey, look, if you just do the right thing, if you give your best, you will be accepted. But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door ready to strike. And this is just absolutely brilliant here. Because what he's saying is that there's this thing called sin. The thing that, that it's like a thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy. It wants to steal away opportunity and kill opportunities and steal and, and destroy relationships. And every time you fail to give your best, every time you do the wrong thing, there's this phenomenon, this force is there, and it's just waiting to take you even deeper. It's waiting to reap even more destruction. And the way that it does it is it's with this little voice. Y'all ever heard that voice? That little voice is trying to justify, rationalize, and project onto others why you didn't do your best. And it's, it's telling half-truths. It's twisting the truth, but ultimately at the source of it is a lie, because at the heart of sin is always a lie. Jesus refers to the devil as the king of all liars. He says that evil is, is really a matter of, of, of a lie. And we've talked about this before in the happy series, that, that sin makes a, a happy promise that sin can't keep. It says, hey, if you do this, you'll be happy, but you just get some pleasure for a little while. Ultimately, you're unhappy, because at the heart of it is a lie. And when you don't bring your best, when you don't do the right thing, what the Lord is saying to Cain, he's saying that there's always going to be this little voice trying to tell you, hey, it's not your fault. Hey, it wasn't that you didn't study. It's that teacher. That teacher is unfair, doesn't like you, or your boss is too demanding, or it's always somebody else's fault. And it's always there. And he finishes off the te teaching down at the bottom. And it will entice you. The sin will entice you. This is going to be attractive. And why is it attractive? Because it lets you off the hook. 
Because you know, when you hold yourself responsible for the times you don't do right, it's painful in the moment. It's not fun. It's not fun to look in the mirror on those occasions. And so sin is trying to say, hey, let me let you off the hook. Let, let's blame somebody else. Let's find somewhere else. And it's going to be attractive. But you, not your mama, you, not your spouse, you, not God, but you must rule over it. This is going to happen. And you need to know it's going to be attractive. It's, it's going to be there. But you need to be responsible for you and the circumstance. So God concludes this amazing teaching Try to help Cain out because he's angry and resentful, right? He didn't get the favor. And so Cain says to his brother Abel, let's go out to a field, you know? And I'm thinking, he just got this amazing teaching, turned the lights on, so he's probably wanting, you know, his brother to go out to the field with him, and he's going to say, hey, look, brother, you know, you, you had this great sacrifice, and I was jealous, and, you know, I got angry. I'm, I'm sorry, right? That's what a reasonable person would do. That's what you all would do, right? When they're out in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. He didn't listen to the teaching at all. Instead, he had projected so much onto his brother that he took it a step further and he kills the man. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Not because the Lord doesn't know. He's giving Cain an opportunity to be responsible for his actions. But Cain, he's all sarcastic. I don't know. Am I my brother's guardian or... If you grew up in church, am I my brother's keeper? Which he's not, right? Because Abel is responsible for Abel's life, except for Cain just took his life, so in a sense, he is responsible for his life. And God, one more time, says, what did you do? I'm giving you a chance to fess up, to make this right, to own it. But Cain says nothing. So the Lord says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. His blood is speaking. It's resounding. It's speaking out. And now you are cursed from the ground. From where? From the ground. Not from God. Okay, this is really important. God's not cursing Cain here, but the ground is. Imagine you have a car and you never change the oil on your car. And then eventually it breaks down on the side of the road. And you're like, God is cursing me. No, God's not cursing you. You did that to yourself. The car is cursing you because you didn't change its oil. You were cursed from the ground that opened its mouth to take your brother's blood from your hand. You did this to yourself, Cain. And when you farm fertile land, it will no longer grow anything for you. You can be in a place where growth is happening, but nothing's going to grow. Let me pause it here for a second. I believe that, that Faith United Church of Christ is becoming increasingly fertile ground. People are growing here. People are sharing stories with me about that. But it is possible to come here and not grow. And the way that works is that if you come here and you don't take responsibility for your own faith development, for that relationship with Jesus Christ that's between you and Jesus, we want to help you, but that's your relationship. And so you can come here and just be a spectator or a consumer, and we're glad to have people do that. But if you stay there, you're not going to grow, even though this is fertile ground. And what will happen is that eventually, since nothing's growing, you'll leave and you'll go somewhere else. And if you don't change your attitude and the way that you function, again, it might be fertile ground and you won't grow. And so you'll leave there and you'll go somewhere else. You'll bounce from church to church to church. Or for some of you, this is work. You bounce from one job to the next job to the next job or relationships, one relationship to the next relationship to the next relationship. And everybody's always the problem, but the common denominator is you. And you've been in fertile ground. But nothing will grow because you have the attitude of Cain, somebody else's fault. And you'll become like Cain, a roving nomad, which is like somebody that's just unstable on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Now that you've driven me, he still doesn't get it. You did this to me, God. Now that you've driven me away from the fertile land and I'm hidden from your presence, and I'm about to become a roving nomad on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. 
which is true. He's endangered himself. In that culture, there wasn't civilized society. Being a roving nomad, not being rooted, not being connected was dangerous. It's dangerous then, in a certain sense, dangerous for us now for different reasons. And God being a God of grace will allow us the freedom to go down a different path Choose a path of sin. God will give you the freedom to do that. But God is still a gracious God. Look what he does. The Lord put a sign on Cain so that no one who found him would assault him. I'm going to protect this guy. He's, he's leaving me, but I'm still going to have some level of protection on him. And then just so we get the point, the writer of Genesis finishes this way. Cain left. Cain left the Lord's presence. The Lord's presence didn't leave Cain Although that's what Cain would say. You did it to me, God. You, you, you. No, Cain left the Lord's presence. And he settled down in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And that's how the story goes. And this story has survived for thousands and thousands of years because what it says about our human nature. There's a tendency in all of us to project rather than reflect, to want to put ownership for our 10% on somebody else. And Cain did that, and it created destruction in his life and the life of those around him. So, how have you been? <laughs> how have you been? This, this is a question that we, we all ask each other. We're going to talk about your time now, okay? This is the last section of my message. And, and we often ask each other this question, you know, how have you been doing? How have you been? And, and a lot of us will say something like this, good but busy. Like, work is so busy, I'm busy with the kids, or like, you know, I never thought retirement would end up being busier than like life before retirement. I don't know how that works, but I've heard it enough from retired people that I totally believe you, that it can be really, really busy. Um, I say this all the time, you know, I'm, I'm busy. You know, it's good, like I love what I'm doing, but I feel busy, never enough time. And so, you know, that's really what we're saying when we say we're busy, I don't have the time. Have you ever replied this before? I'd like to do that. I don't have the time. I like to exercise. I don't have the time. I like to budget. I don't have the time. I like to volunteer. I just don't have the time. But what I want to tell you today, what I want to invite you to is to stop saying this. Don't ever say this again, because it's not true. I'm going to show you why in a moment, but here's what you should say instead. You should just say, I choose not to invest the time. You might not say that to somebody who wants to hang out with you. Hey, Scott, would you like to get together? And sorry, I choose not to invest time with you, right? Like, right? So say it to yourself, but this internal dialogue matters immensely. And the second statement is actually true, where the first one, I don't have the time, which suggests like the reason you don't have the time is because somebody didn't give it to you, that you're not really ultimately responsible. But you have the same amount of time as everybody else. You have 168 hours a week. Busy people have 168 hours a week. People with a lot of leisure time, 168 hours a week. People who get a lot accomplished, guess how much time they have a week? 168, yeah, some people are cashing on. Yeah, you know, people that don't accomplish much with their lives, they have. There we go, come on now, one more time. How much time do we have? 168, we all get the same amount of time. Let me break it down for you. Say you sleep seven hours a night, that's 56 hours a week. Say you work 56 hours a week, that leaves, and that could be commute time or whatever, that leaves you with 56 hours a week to invest wherever you want. 56 hours. That's seven hours a day. And it's your time. And, and here's one thing that, I, that I've noticed is that if, if you don't take responsibility for your time, your most valuable possession, somebody else will fill up your time. Or it'll, it'll just be spent in ways that you don't know what happened. What happened to the time? The day just flew by. It's so easy, isn't it? Please tell me I'm not the only one that experiences this. Right? So where do we spend the time? I don't know where you spend yours, but the average American spends five hours a day on TV. I'm so busy. I don't have the time. Well, <laughs> no wonder if you're watching five hours of television a day. I like to watch television. I do. Like there's some great shows on. We watch Netflix, you know, we, we do it all. It's great. Sometimes there's good sermon illustrations even. But five hours. 
If I'm spending this much time or even have that, do I have the time? Do I have the time to exercise? Do I have the time to take care of my body and my health? Do I have the time to invest in relationships? Do I have the time to manage my money well? Do I have the time to get involved at my church? Do I have the time to read the scripture and to pray? You want to totally disrupt your life in a positive way, I believe? Then do this. Start each day with 15 minutes of Bible reading and prayer. 15 minutes. You get seven hours a day of bonus time. I'm just saying 15 minutes. And it's best if you start each day, beginning of the day, right at the beginning. Your best. Give your best. Invest your best in order to live your best. And we've talked about it before. Uh, uh, there's, if you have a smartphone, which like at least half of you, maybe three quarters of you probably do at this point, you can download the Bible app and you can set a reminder. And it'll say, hey, read your 15 minutes this morning at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock, whenever you wake up. You can do a Bible plan. I'm doing one on prayer right now, which is great because it's helping me to pray things that I wouldn't focus on. And it, it will remind you and it will orient you. It will invest in the relationship that sets up every other relationship. 15 minutes. And maybe you're like old school and, and, or you just, you just like a flesh and blood Bible, which is not flesh and blood, but we say that about Bibles. And so you want to read a, like a real print Bible. And you're thinking, I don't know where to start. I got a suggestion for you. Matthew 5. Anybody heard of that before? Yeah, Matthew 5. It's where the Sermon on the Mount is. It's where we work through this in the happiness series. It is some of the greatest material there is on the planet. It's Jesus himself teaching. 15 minutes. You could do more. Like you should. You'll benefit if you do more. But if you start there, it will make a difference. It will change your life. Pick a chair, pick a spot, get your coffee, your tea, whatever it is. Set the stage in just 15 minutes to start your day. Connect with the source of life and it will change your life. Got to be responsible for your time. I'm going to finish with a scripture. And, and this last scripture, it might sting a bit. Okay. And I don't intend to be judgy here on this one. This, this is coming at me too. Okay. But I, I say this to you because I, I love you as much as somebody in my position can love a crowd of people. But I want you to hear this from Proverbs. The lazy have strong desires, but receive nothing. What's the problem with these people? Is it that they don't desire to grow in their relationship with Jesus? No, that's not the problem. Is there a problem that they don't desire to be healthy, that they don't desire to, to fix their marriage or invest in that relationship with that coworker or what have you? That's not the problem. No, they have strong desires. The problem is, is what? They're lazy. You all know what laziness is, right? I mean, like, I could get a PhD in lazy, you know? We all have struggled with laziness as part of the human condition. Hard to get going. But the appetite of the diligent, the disciplined, the focused, the committed, it's satisfied. They get a return on their investment. And it's a good one. And they're satisfied. They're happy. They have peace. So let us pray. Oh, Lord, you've given us valuable things. You've given us some measure of money. Thank you for that. You've given us relationships. Oh, we thank you for those. And you've given us time. So help us to stop thinking we don't have enough because we all have the same. Let us lean into the truth rather than to believe that little lie that is enticing because it allows us not to be responsible for ourselves, and that feels good for a moment. But those that are diligent, Lord, you say, those are the ones that are satisfied, and I think it's even better than that. When we take responsibility to use the gifts that you've given us, you say that you multiply them, and that you make the impact of our lives flow into the lives of others, all for your glory. So inspire and convict and just help those that are here, including me, just to improve, Lord. Let us connect with you each day. Let's make that a priority 
so that you will lead our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.